Awesome Father, you are Lord. Jesus. Come 
There's a song we sing in revival, and we've done it a time or two. But I never get tired of it because it puts in a nutshell everything that it is. It causes us to just remember that we used to be at an extreme disadvantage, but we are no longer. Well, I, I went to the enemy's camp and I, I took back what he stole from me.
excited every time I think about Jesus. <laughs> I get excited every time I think about the Lord. I get excited every time I think about my Jesus. I get to be a stiff shirt, stuff necked religious girl, sitting up in the balcony so I didn't have to look back because I wasn't dancing. But then the Holy Ghost got a hold of me. You see where the Spirit of the Lord is? There's a little thing called liberty. And when the Spirit of the Lord is, there's a big old thing called joy. That's why I 
Many waters cannot quench your love, and rivers cannot overwhelm it, and neither can my cold religious heart. Oceans of fear cannot conceal your love for me. Many waters cannot quench your love. Oceans of fear cannot conceal your love for me. Your love for me.
Lord, it was you created the heavens, and Lord, it was your hand that put the stars in their place, and Lord, Lord, it is your voice. that commands the morning, even oceans and their waves, bow at your feet. Sometimes I think we forget that. Lord, it was you created the heavens. Lord, it was your hand that put the stars in their place. Yes. And Lord, it was your voice that commanded. Oh. 
to tell you Lord I love you I just came to tell you you're worthy of my praise I just came to tell you Lord you're holy I just came to
Hallelujah. We have a reason to worship God. We have a reason to lift our hands. Jesus is risen. Jesus has defeated the works of darkness. The Son of God is victorious. Hallelujah. There's hope. There's purpose. There's liberty. Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Just keep this attitude of worship tonight. You know, we may not be the biggest crowd, but let me tell you, the biggest God is here. Hallelujah. He's still King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. I believe tonight there's going to be lives changed. You've come to the right place. Jesus Christ is still the transformer of lives. He's still the liberator. Tonight you've come and maybe you have a need in your life. Maybe there's something you've been trying to get free from. Maybe there's a loved one that needs to be touched tonight. Folks, God is here. The Lord is here in our midst. And we are going to see him touch you tonight. And I just want to encourage you to go after God. You know, maybe you're saying, well, I, I was just brought by a friend. Or I've just come in, you know, uh, by accident. I saw a, a nice place to get out of the, the evening uh, uh, weather. Well, you've come into the sunshine. You know. Maybe you're feeling some oppression in your life. Well, I'll tell you, relief is just a repentance away. God's going to touch you. God's going to touch you tonight. I want to thank you, and uh, maybe you could be seated. We'll give you a chance to relax, and we'll just keep the, the worship team uh, let's just keep you up here just a second. I think maybe we've got just uh, a little music we'll play in just a moment. We've just come off the field with a team. We just were in Israel. How many of you know Israel needs prayer? Hallelujah. And friends, I'll tell you, revival is the only answer. The power of God. And I'm so thankful that we're living in an hour when God is moving. We're living in a time when the Lord is arisen and stood up and saying, I'm going to go and get my church. And we're, we're often intrigued over the, the different things that need to transpire to see Jesus come back. But you know what? Everything's coming into place. You may be looking at things from the little microcosm of your life. But folks up in the throne, up in the command center, where the controls are moved by the king, you know, where he's telling angels go and come, where he's lifting up nations and putting down others. I tell you, things are all right. You know, someday Israel will be saved. They'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Someday, Jew, Gentiles, Arabs, Turks, Africans, Chinese, Japanese, Finnish, you know, Indians, they're all going to come together and worship God at the throne and say, He has done all things well. It's going to happen. We were there during election time, and, and we were able to pray through and fast and pray through the plans and the purposes of God. You know, God has a perfect timing. And right now, just to take one little country, you know, in God's spiritual time clock, that little country's got a key. It may not be big, but it's just like a little slit for a little key to go in. Things are happening, and I'm so excited that there are people in the world that are recognizing the hour of God. And He's working out all things. Things will happen in the Mideast, right? Things will change over in some of the wars that are out there. But most important right now is that you're here and you need to know what's going to happen in your life. So this is an hour, folks, to dive in head first. We want to welcome you here tonight. You've come on the Wednesday night. This is usually our school night. But as you know, schools are uh, out for the summer. And because you are in control. Because you are in control Yes, 
Yes, you are in control. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. You can be seated. Hallelujah. You know, Brother John found out, Brother John Calva, who's what nations are represented here and what states are represented here. I want to see how many cities are represented here from Florida. Okay, I'm just joking. Okay, Pastor Bob doesn't want to wait another 30 minutes before he preaches. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Somehow that makes it look like there's more people here, doesn't it? Well, there's several nations represented here, many states. And uh, how many people here from Florida? 
How many live here locally? Praise God. Well, we're not into numbers, but speaking of numbers, we have, we are kind of low right now on uh, registration for our summer sessions that are coming up the beginning of June. They begin June 15th, go through June 30th, seven week, seven one week sessions. And uh, we were having a little discussion in the back room here. And, you know, Jesus performed miracles and the multitudes came to him. But then he began to sift them. He began to cut, re reduce them actually in size. Well, we need miracles right now because we have our, 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 our summer uh, crowds, our registrations for our courses are down. So we have some of these brochures. You probably have seen them. They're, you can pick one up in the back here in the back lobby on your way out. And uh, especially if you're going to be here locally, Take advantage of that. Um, those, how many plan, how many from out of state plan to be back this summer, sometime this summer? Praise God. One, two, three, a few. Praise God. I would ask you to consider coming back for, for not only for the revival meetings, but for these summer sessions. Let me just go through them real quickly. Um, they begin on June 15th, as I said. How many have one of these? Anybody pick one, pick one of these up? I mean, I was looking at these subjects here as I was sitting there, and uh, first session beginning June 15th talks about releasing the anointing. So after you get the anointing, you can go into the second week and go deeper into revival. Then the third week, you can receive the power of Pentecost. How many like it so far? <laughs> then after you receive the power of Pentecost, you can learn how to evangelize and win souls. By the way, I'm going to be teaching that session. My name's Bert Farius, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm having evangelist Steve Hill. He pleaded that he could do a session with me, so he's right there also. He's going to be doing a session with me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm trying to loosen myself up as well as you. Nobody's getting any of my jokes here today. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody know Steve Hill, evangelist Steve Hill? We have another Steve Hill on staff here, and he says he's the original because he's older. Actually, we have two Steve Hills in this revival, believe it or not. Then after you learn how to evangelize, you can go deeper in personal revival. Then you can learn how to intercede for the lost. Then you can get more in the presence of God. Seven weeks, that, that, that sounds like seven weeks of dynamite to me. Hallelujah. We've got guests. We've, we've not only got our gifted faculty that are teaching here, people like Dr. Brown and Pastor Bob Phillips, whom you're going to hear in a minute, but we have outside speakers as well that come from other nations to teach in, in these sessions. So avail yourself to them. There's still plenty of room. Amen. We need more people so that Jesus can, can sift them. Actually, that's not a good word. The devil sifts people. Jesus purges them by his fire. Amen. So praise God, pick one up on the way out. And listen, if nothing else, sometimes we're always thinking of ourselves, but you might know some people that want to be down here in the summer. Take some of these home with you. Take them home to your church and encourage people to come on out and get touched by God. Amen. The ultimate thing that we're after is spreading revival fire. I believe the reason God keeps kissing this revival is because it's not about us. It's about getting it out to the nations, getting it out to America. Amen. God bless you. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, we do welcome uh, all of those that are here visiting with us for the first time and, and uh, those of you that have come to be with us. Let me, uh, let me just tell you that those of you that have come from out of town, you come some distance and, and you, uh, you'll be staying here uh, throughout the week. I want to, again, uh, reiterate what uh, John said, John Kava, uh, that uh, there will be opportunities tomorrow night uh, Thursday night is a prayer meeting. Now, let me tell you why some of the change came for the revival. Because uh, one of the things that John Kilpatrick, the pastor, uh, felt was essential is that that used to be on Tuesday nights. And a lot of people would come and they'd come in for the revival on Wednesday and they would miss the prayer meeting. And yet it was prayer that was the heart 
I believe that, that I won't say birthed the revival, but it certainly was what laid the groundwork of people hungry for God in prayer. And you'll see some banners around this auditorium. And those banners are not things that are idolized. They're not just for colorful little uh, emblems that are there, but banners, in addition, there are 12 banners, and there's more than that now that are brought out at various stations around this congregation. And tomorrow night, people will be invited to bring the burden that they have. There'll be one for schools, there'll be one for pastors, one for healing, one for revival. And to bring the burden that they have and, and, and pray at either that banner or more than one banner. And I want to tell you something, it's electrifying. Uh, it is absolutely electrifying. And those of you who know, is it, is, am I telling the truth? It's electrifying. And God will touch you and you get a feel for what's happening and what brought uh, the foundation of the revival. And so I want to encourage you to take advantage of that. Now, during the, day, the daytime, uh, <clears throat> there are some sessions that take place. Uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, uh, there will be someone teaching. Normally, Brother Kerry Robertson handles this, but he's not here. Uh, he's, he's away uh, this week. But there will be somebody uh, from the staff that will be discussing what takes place. There's a fourfold approach that the church has used to not only maintain revival, but is birthed out of the revival. And it's incredible. If you're a pastor, <clears throat> or want to be a pastor, if you're a pastor of a church or a ministry, I want to tell you, there'll be a lot that you can gain from this. You begin to get to see the inside workings of this. And then at 11 o'clock, Lila Terhune, who heads up the intercession, <clears throat> will be here. And she uh, will be also teaching. Then on Friday and Saturday, and I, it's 11 o'clock, isn't it, Ward? Dr. Michael Brown will be uh, uh, in a session right here in this auditorium. Uh, I don't know what his subject is going to be, but I can tell you you'll be blessed by it. It'll have something to do with intensifying your relationship with Jesus Christ. It'll challenge you, and it'll also minister to you. So Friday and Saturday at 11 o'clock here in this auditorium, those are things that you can partake of during the daytime if you're here visiting us, and we just praise God for you. I want you to turn in your Bibles to a very familiar scripture, uh, probably to most of you, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I, I want you to, uh, how many of you have a Bible? Let me see. Praise God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and then we're going to pray, but I want to, I want to share several scriptures with you. <clears throat> and here's the title of my message. Are you going to finish your course? Are you going to finish your course? Now, the Bible says that we have a course to run. Sometimes it's referred to a race, but we have a course. God has a plan. You'll hear this said frequently that God has a plan for your life. He's got something that he wants you to accomplish. The question is, are you going to accomplish it? Are you going to run your race? Are you going to run the course? Are you going to finish the course? Now, I want to read some passages of Scripture, and then we're going to pray. Verse 1, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearance and his kingdom. Now, get those words. I solemnly charge you. But what's he going to charge us with? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now, I want to tell you something, that every believer, if you're a believer, and I don't mean that you belong to a church or somehow you fill out a, an application or for membership or you signed a card or you came forward. If you're a believer, you're living for Jesus Christ and you know that you have Jesus as your Savior, these words apply to every single one of us. Now, when he's talking about preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, I, I know that there's, well, that just applies to preachers. I don't believe that. I believe that applies to every single believer. You're to preach the word. It's to be burning inside you. It's to be a part of you. You're to be able, in season, out of season, no matter what happens, to exhort, to rebuke. You are to be an ambassador of Jesus, his presence, and his word, and his kingdom. You may not have a pulpit ministry, but I tell you something, you have a ministry. Now, notice what he says. I, I think, first of all, we have to realize that we've allowed verse 3 to overtake us. We live in these days. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 
but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance, look at this, in accordance to their own desires. Now, I, I, want you to, I want you to understand what I believe this means. I believe this means that we've already missed some great opportunities. I believe that what this verse is telling us is that we ought to have had revival long before now. That we ought to be on fire for God long before now. I tell you, Kerry Robertson said something from, he's the associate pastor here, he said something from this pulpit a few Sundays ago, and it struck me like an arrow into my own heart. He said, I've been in the ministry for over 40 years. He said, for the last five years, I've had the fire of God in my life. I don't know what I did for the rest of the time. Well, I want to tell you something. I also believe this, that not only have we missed some great opportunities, I believe that there would be people that have, would have been saved in the kingdom if God had a church on fire. I believe there are people right now that are caught up with the world and in the world because they didn't have a witness. They didn't have the instruction coming from God's people. It was missing. They didn't have a church to go to. Or they went to a church expecting to find God, expecting to find the fire of God, having a need met, and what they got were programs. I believe we've missed some great opportunities. I believe we'll be held accountable for that. But I also believe this. I believe we're living in days that are some of the most spectacular days in which we can live. And I believe we have a window of opportunity. And I believe that that window may close sometime. But I want to tell you, I believe we have to seize the moment. And we have to move through that. We have to be exactly what he's saying right here. Now notice what he says. Verse 4. And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Turn aside to myths. Now that means incorrect pictures and images of Jesus, incorrect ideas of who he is and what he's like, things that are not true about him. And that's where much of this United States is. They don't understand the Jesus. They've accepted another gospel that's really not the true gospel. But God is bringing forth, not only through this revival, but elsewhere, all over the world, he's stirring his people. That's why you're here tonight. Something stirred you up to come here. You may not know what stirred you up, but something stirred you up or you wouldn't be here. Now notice this. Here's what he says. But you, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Now I want to say this to you. I'm not an evangelist, but I love to do evangelistic work. You may not be an evangelist. He's writing this to Timothy, but there's a bigger picture. This wasn't just for Timothy. It's part of our Bible. The Holy Spirit selected this for every one of us. You say, I'm not an evangelist. Well, let me ask this part. Are you fulfilling your ministry? Are you fulfilling the thing that God called you for? Now, notice this. He says, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Now, look at this verse. This is the one I wanted to get to. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. He's, he's dying. He said, I know. Somehow the Holy Spirit had communicated to him that he was close to his departure. Now, can you imagine this? I want to be able to say this. My greatest fear, and I want to use that word reservedly, but it is there. My greatest fear is that I would stand before Jesus one day, and, and as I stand before him, I have that sense, that awesome sense. My wife knows this because I've shared it with her many, many times more. Have that sense with just looking into his eyes that some way, somehow, I would know that I did not finish my course. To stand before him and to know he wouldn't have to say a word. Just stand before him and some way, somehow, just have that sense, that sinking feeling. How many of you have ever been guilty of something and you stood before somebody? I remember when I was a young boy, um, now I, I didn't, I've never smoked cigarettes or, or, or any, anything uh, like that with tobacco, but I remember when I was a young boy that um, my grandfather, he lived on a farm in, in Kentucky and he, he used to chew tobacco. In fact, he raised tobacco, and he, chewed, he would chew tobacco, and he always had a wad of tobacco, you know, in his mouth, and he spit. Now, I, maybe you do that. I personally think that's one of the ugliest habits you can ever get, but, but I just want to tell you, I, I saw my grandfather do that, you know, and he just, he would, uh, 
he would he would just he, he would spin and he had this tobacco and I always wondered my cousin and I wondered what does that taste like now, now, I want to tell you, we had, a, we had a love for our grandfather, so we felt like if, boy, if, if, if granddad's doing it, it's got to taste good. I mean, it's just got to taste good. He wouldn't be doing it if it didn't taste good. So one day, he went out, and, and we just happened to run into the house, and laying right there was just, just a fresh cut of chewing tobacco. And so I looked at it, and my cousin looked at it, and we both looked at each other, and we just got this idea. Now's the time. We're going to find out what this tastes like. And so, and so we just uh, we cut a little piece off. In fact, I, I take that back. We cut off a bigger piece than we should have cut off. I mean, if a little bit's good, a lot's got to be better, right? And so we just cut a little bit off, and we put it in our mouth. We hadn't any more gotten that into our mouth and started chewing. And I mean, it was the most horrible stuff I've ever tasted in my life. I mean, it just it. And then what happened was we heard the back screen door. We heard it slam shut. And we thought, oh, no, we are caught. And then we heard him walking. My, he was, he was, it was a, just a wooden floor. We heard him walking, and, and we knew we didn't have any place to run. There's no place to spit. You know, we can't do it right there. We're, we're, we're a place where we can't. So what we did, guess what we did? We did the only thing you can do. Yeah. We swallowed it. We swallowed it. And I never will forget. He walked into that room just about the time we got the last gulp down, trying our best to change the countenance of our face. Look at him right in the eye, and you know what he did? He walked right in, and he looked down at the tobacco, he looked up at our faces and didn't say a word, walked right out of the room. <laughs> didn't say a word. I mean, he knew what was on our face. He could tell. I don't think he knew at that time what we did with it. But he waited until we got good and sick. I mean, sick. And, uh, and then he came up to us a little later and, and, uh, that day, and he said, uh, hey, boys, come on out here. And so we walked out there, and he said, uh, <clears throat> you want another bite? How about another cut off of this? You know, I don't want to stand before Jesus and have him look at my face and know where I missed it. And me just be able to look at his face like I did my grandfather that day and to know that he knows that I missed it. And here's the question I have for you again. Are you going to finish your course? Are the things that you're doing right now in your life spiritually the things that are going to enable you to finish your course? Or are the things that are in your life right now, the things that you're doing with your life right now, are they going to be the things that are going to be the disqualifiers? You know, he says something about this course. What he says is it's not going to be easy. Because in verse 5 he says, Be sober in all things. It's going to take a seriousness to finish your course. It's not going to be things as usual. You can't just look at the preacher and say, I hope he finishes his course. You have a course to finish. You've got something that God wants to do with your life. And then he says this. He says, endure hardship. Now, that tells me something. Be sober, endure hardship. That means it's not going to be easy for you to fulfill your course. Most, most Christians are just floating through. You know what I'm talking about? They're just floating through. If I were to ask this question, could you answer it? Because I'm going to ask it. <laughs> what would you like to accomplish in your life before you die that would count in the kingdom of God? Now, I, I, want, I want to just, without you raising your hand, I'm going to ask that question again. What would you like to accomplish in your life before you die for the kingdom of God. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I wonder how many in this auditorium have even considered the question. I wonder how many of us in this place have even said, God, I'd like to accomplish this before I die. Maybe you have. But I would venture to say, if we took a survey, many of you would never even have seriously considered it. And my question is, how are you going to finish the course if you have no goal? If you can't define the race, how are you going to finish the course? And what is God after in your life? Does he want you to have a good job, contribute to the church and the ministry, go through life just 
doing whatever you do, and then one day you die and you, you appear before God, and then you're just said, come on into heaven. Is that what he wants, or is there something that he's after in your life personally? I believe the scriptures teach overwhelmingly that he is. I want you to turn with me in the Old Testament because Genesis chapter 49, I'm going to take you through several scriptures tonight. I'm sure I won't get through all that I would like to get through, but Genesis chapter 49, there's, <clears throat> there's a list of people that are mentioned here that were <clears throat> sons of Jacob. He had assembled his sons together. He's, he's at a place too of finishing his course. Jacob's at a place where his course, his life is running short. So he pulls his sons together and he begins to say things prophetically over them. He's speaking into their lives. There's a particular person here that he's talking about by the name of Reuben. And we're going to talk about him in a moment, but I want you to see what it says about Reuben. Genesis chapter 49, verse 3. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. Now, I want you, before you read on, I want you to understand that prophetically, that's what belonged to Reuben. But there's a deadly spirit of Reuben loose in the church. You're my firstborn, God says. You're entitled to an inheritance, and that inheritance is a double portion. And not only that, but I placed you in a place, Reuben, because you're the firstborn, you have a destiny to fulfill. You're to be a leader of leaders. You're to step out. Reuben, there's something that's to take place. You're preeminent in dignity. Because of your position, there's a dignity that's about you. You're preeminent in power. You're to carry forth my might, Reuben. But there's a problem. Reuben is not going to finish his course. Reuben has a problem, and he mentions this. He's a very unstable individual. Here's what it says about him. He says... Verse 4, uncontrolled or unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, and he went up to my couch. I'm not, I'm not going to go into what actually took place, but I want to tell you what he did, I believe, was simply the symptom of what he was. What I'm saying to you is he committed an immoral act, but I want you to understand that what the problem was was where he was. He was unstable. He was uncontrolled. Now, let me tell you what that means because it, it's got an interesting meaning to it. I don't know about you, but see, I can, I can pick up this glass, and I, I can hold this glass, I can hold the water, but if I take the water out, I can't hold it. It's, a, it's uncontrollable. I can't grasp it. I can't hold on to it. Interestingly enough, there was something about Reuben. Let me tell you what his name really means. Reuben's name actually carries with it this significance to it, which means <clears throat> to be pampered. That's what this word uncontrolled means. Without getting a precise definition, what it literally means is someone who ought to have some stability about them. There ought to be something you could grab hold of. There ought to be something that they could be used for, but there's a problem that they have. The problem is they're as unstable as water. You can't grab hold of anything in their lives. They can't grab hold of anything. And one of the reasons is because they have been blessed, but they've been pampered. Actually, the word means to be coddled. Now, can I tell you something? I was, I was speaking at another church, speaking at a church in Georgia on Mother's Day. And um, actually, I hadn't planned on doing a Mother's Day message. And, uh, and so, <clears throat> I didn't even know when we made this arrangement for, for the, me to speak in this church, my wife and family were going with me. And uh, I didn't even realize that it was Mother's Day. I just, I, I had... I mean, I'd sent some flowers to, to my mother and, and had made all of those arrangements. I remember it, but I forgot that Sunday was Mother's Day. And so I called the pastor on Saturday just before we were getting. In fact, it was, of course, the graduation. We had the graduation for the students. And then I left right after graduation. And, and I made a mistake because I called him. I called the pastor and told him about what time I was getting away and about how, because we were driving. And uh, I said, by the way, I said, did you ever think, Pastor, that it's Mother's Day? He said, uh, no, no, I I was going to call you about that. And I said, well, I mean, I don't have to come. He said, no, no, I want you to come. But he said, I, I want you to, 
Well, you just kind of, brother, just be free. Do whatever God wants you to do. Well, I know what he's wanting me to do. I said, are you wanting me to preach a Mother's Day message? And he said, well, I tell you, it sure would get me out of a jam if you did. And so anyway, here we are getting ready to drive to Georgia and uh, to Macon, Georgia. And, and at that moment, I now have the, uh, you know, it's, we're going to get there at like midnight or one o'clock in the morning and uh, get up the next morning and I've got to have a Mother's Day message. And so I, I, as we're driving along, I'm, I'm trying to think of what, what, what do you want me to say? I, I mean, I don't know about you all, but I, I really hate special days. <laughs> I really hate to preach on special days. And not that I don't appreciate mothers and appreciate fathers and all of that, but, but it's just, I, I just like to get whatever God's burning in my heart at that moment. And Mother's Day's not always burning in my heart. Forgive me, but it's just not always the preeminent thing in my life. And, and uh, I do honor my mother. But what I'm saying is this. I was trying to get a message while we're driving. I'm tired and I'm sleepy and so on. But God began to speak to me about all the references that are made to God, not as father, but as mother. And one of the things that he talks about is he'll coddle you on his knees. He'll bounce you. He, he will coddle you. But can I tell you something? There comes a time when you get too much coddling. And not all God does is bounce you on his knees and coddle you. He deals with sin. He corrects you. He disciplines you. Reuben apparently had had so much coddling that he got to a place where that's what his desire was for. His desire was for ease. He didn't want to endure hardship. He didn't want to have a difficult time. He didn't want a difficult course. He just wanted to endure pleasure and ease. Now, Reuben did not fulfill his course. I won't turn there, but in Numbers chapter 32, in the first few verses, you'll find out that whenever they got ready to cross the Jordan River, that by this time Reuben and Gad had accumulated a lot of livestock. And as they got to the Jordan River, they said, fellas, go on across. Go on into the inheritance that God's got. You all go ahead, but we're going to stay right here. Look at this land. It's really great for livestock. And you know we got a lot of livestock. We're going to stay on this side of the Jordan. And even when the leaders begin to come against them and say, are you going to let us go fight the battles? Are you going to let us go into the battle alone? You're not going to stand with us? And finally, Reuben says, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll go in, we'll fight a few battles. I'll help you go through a few things, and then when it's all over, I'm going to go back across the Jordan. Now, what I'm saying is that there are Christians, some of you may be like that right now, that you'll fight a few battles, but there's a limit as to what you're going to do because you found a place to be comfortable. You'll enter the war. Some of you may not even enter the war, but you'll enter the war up to a place. And maybe you haven't even defined what that place is, but the devil knows what it is, and God knows what it is. And you'll go into the battle to a place, and then you're going to stop. You're going to pull back. You'll allow God to deal with you up to a point. And then you'll say, no. I believe there are a lot of people who attend the revival that come to that very place. They're under conviction. They come to the altar. God just really works in their lives. And then they go back home. And before long, they're settling back into where they were before because they've got so much livestock. They're looking for a nice, comfortable place. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you going to finish your course? Reuben didn't finish his course. I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33. Deuteronomy, chapter 33. There's a name here that's only mentioned four times in the Bible. How many of you know God's big on names? God likes names. I say, how many of you know God's big on names? He changes names. In fact, some of the things that he says in the book of Revelation is in Revelation 2.17. If you become an overcomer, if you'll walk an overcoming life, if you'll enter the battle and you'll fight against the things that try to pull you down, here's what he says he'll do. I'll feed you some of the hidden manna and I'll give you a white stone and a new name written on that stone. God says, if you'll be an overcomer, I have a name picked out for you. I have something I want to call you. There was Simon. God called him Peter. God changed his name. 
There are names that are in the Bible that were negatively meant, but God changed their names. I don't know where you are tonight, but I want to tell you, there's a man by the name of Jabez. Jabez, you know what his mother named him? Jabez. You know what the name means? Trouble or pain. How would you like that to be your name? Every time a group saw you coming, they say, here comes trouble. That was his name. The incredible thing about Jabez, though, the book of Chronicles, there's this list of, you want some really interesting readings? I mean, you want to stay up at night, you're really tired, turn to this, turn to, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter, was it chapter 4? What is it? Let me look at it. I'll find it here in just a minute. Don't turn there. First Chronicles. No, Second Chronicles. It's in the Bible. Second Chronicles. I've got to find this. If it takes me all night, now I'm stuck right here. Or First Chronicles. Was it chapter 10? First Chronicles chapter 11? No, that's not it. First Chronicles chapter 4, how about that? Yeah, First Chronicles chapter 4. I'm not even going to try to pronounce these names, all right? Don't turn there, but if you want something really interesting, you just go through this whole list. I mean, you know, it goes, it goes something like this, you know. And Nederah bore him, Ahuzam, Hephrath, Timonai. I don't know these names. Do you all know these names? All these names go down, and it says, and so-and-so begot so-and-so. And so-and-so -and -so begot somebody else. And so-and-so was the father of so-and-so. I mean, that's interesting reading, don't you? don't you? Don't you know why the Holy Spirit put that in there? I mean, you, you, you're just about ready to fall asleep. You want to do some devotional reading. Get into that chapter. But then all of a sudden, you come to verse 10. And in verse 10, it begins to talk about Jabez. I'll tell you what I picture. What I picture. It's almost like the Holy Spirit couldn't hold back any longer. The Holy Spirit wrote, I believe, every page of this book. And the Holy Spirit's writing, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so begat so-and-so. Because he knew somebody's going to study that someday. I don't know who that person is, but he knew. Somebody was going to study that someday. And so here they are. So it's, and then all of a sudden, Jabez's name comes, and it's like the Holy Spirit stops and says, I can't go further without saying something about this. And his mother named him Jabez, which means I bore him in pain. I don't know why she called him pain and trouble. I really don't know. I don't know why your mama called you trouble. But let me tell you something. Jabez changed his destiny because he called out to God and he said, God, touch me. God, enlarge, enlarge my borders. God, increase my influence. God, put your hand upon me. God, keep me from evil. Bless me. And the scripture says, so the Lord did as Jabez requested. I like that. That means that you might have something in some place in your life where you've gotten off course from your destiny. Maybe the world just has chewed you up to pieces. Something's happening. You say, destiny? Me fulfill God's course? You don't understand. You don't understand how much I'm hurting on the inside. Let me tell you something. You haven't been called trouble yet as a name, but God can change where you are. In the book of Philippians, in the second chapter, there's a man by the name of Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what it means. That's his name. The name Epaphroditus means given to Aphro, uh, Aphrodite. Was he? When I've gone to India, I, there's an interpreter that's gone with me that literally was rescued. How many of you ever heard of Amy Carmichael? A lot of you have. Amy Carmichael has written a lot of books. She was a powerful woman, powerful evangelist. She went all alone by herself to India and has an incredible complex, She's written a number of books. It's incredible what she accomplished. Let me tell you something. My interpreter that I've used a lot of times over there at one point was captured and turned over and dedicated by his parents to a Hindu temple for prostitution. 
I, I want to tell you something. You know, I, I sometimes wonder if we realize what other people have gone through when we in America so wrestle over some of the things that have happened to us, our backgrounds, raised up with a maybe an alcoholic father, an abusing father, maybe a, an abusive situation, whatever it would be. We understand that, but let me tell you something. Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus had his name given to him but his life paul says he's my fellow worker he's a messenger i'm sending to you he's a soldier for the gospel of the kingdom i don't know how he was given to aphrodite i don't know what happened but all i know is he changed all of that because god met him see i don't know where you are tonight but god wants to change your life in a moment we're going to pray for everybody we're going to pray for those that want prayer and I tell you God can change your life radically starting tonight. The whole direction of your destiny can change. And no matter how far off course you have been from what God wanted to do with you, can I tell you something? You can get put right back on course in a moment, just like that. In a moment. Where was I? I was in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 33. There's a man or a name mentioned here. Actually, it's prophetic of the nation. Deuteronomy chapter 33. This name only appears four times in the Bible. Three of them in the book of Deuteronomy. His name is Jeshurun. It's a name spoken of to describe the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 5 and verse 26. I want to read verse 26 to you. There's none like the God of Jeshurun. Can you say amen to that? I say there's none like the God of Jeshurun who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is a dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he drove out the enemy from before you and he said, destroy. What a powerful statement. There's none like Jesus Christ. What's he talking about? He goes on and he makes another statement in this particular chapter. Look at verse 29. This is not Jeshurun, but it's Israel again. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord. If you've been saved, if you're in this place saved tonight, God says there's nothing like, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like you, saved of the Lord. But the first thing that was ever mentioned about Jeshurun was not a good thing. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. This is the first thing ever said about him. First reference to him in the Bible was not a good reference. Let me tell you first of all what his name means. I'm not a scholar, but I want to tell you as I searched the scriptures, I found out that Jeshurun is described by various scholars in different ways. Probably foremost, the word Jeshurun is described to mean upright one, an upright nation. But as you dig a little deeper, you find out that it wasn't just the word upright, but it was a very poetic name. Probably the best name we could use to compare with it was darling upright one, meaning somebody very special to God. Somebody in a very intimate relationship, not just in a crowd, but somebody in a very intimate relationship, a darling upright one. But his name also means extremely or supremely happy. Part of his name means to be blessed. I'm not sure which one's correct, so I'm going to use all four of them. Jeshurun, in God's image, in God's eyes, is the people of God. It's speaking of the nation Israel. I believe we can carry that over and say he's speaking of you. If you're born again, if you've been born into the kingdom of God, what God sees you is Jeshurun, a type, a prophetic name, which means that God sees you as the darling, upright, supremely happy, blessed one. That's the name he gives. That's what it means. But I want you to notice the first mention of Jeshurun. Verse 15, but Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat, thick, and sleek. 
You know, I know something about that. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, I used to play a lot of racquetball. I don't mean I used to play a lot of racquetball a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I used to play a lot of racquetball. And a couple of weeks, I went with Ward Simpson here. And we went, we, we played racquetball. And I, you know, I, I could envision, I, I used to be, I can't prove it now, but I used to be a pretty decent racquetball player. I, I used to be able to hit, I don't know how many have ever seen racquetball played and, and, or anything, but you're in a court with just four walls and you hit the ball off the front wall and then you constantly try to, the ball can only bounce once and the best way to play is that if you can just hit the ball down low and straight and you got good coordination, you can make that ball hit with just a few inches of the front wall and just bing, just skip like that. There's no way, there's no chance of anybody getting it. Or you can hit the corners and you can make it bounce around them and you can do all those things. I couldn't, I wasn't great, but I used to be able to do some of those things. A couple of weeks ago, we went to play racquetball. And, and I, and I, uh, I it kind of went like this. Ward would hit a ball. And uh, I would, I'd be standing here looking at the ball coming. And, and the ball would bounce right in front of me. Or every once in a while, I'd reach out to hit the ball, and it wasn't there. Just a lot of wind. Or, or he'd hit a shot, and it would go bouncing around the wall, and you're supposed to follow it. You keep your eyes on the ball, and I'd watch it go around like this, and there it would be, and all of a sudden, there it went. I didn't even take a shot at it. And what was happening is my mind was saying, you dummy. You could have gotten that shot. Now get going, my body would say. Ha, 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 ha. We don't do what we used to do. And my mind would say, it was so easy. Just step out. You just stood there and watched it. And my body said, I didn't just stand there and watch it. I can't move. <laughs> so I had this dialogue going on with my body. I understand verse 15. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You're grown fat and thick and sleek. How many of you know a little bit about what I'm talking about? Can I tell you the condition can also happen to you spiritually? And, and you know, the tragedy is that this is not a brand new Christian. This is somebody that has been so blessed, so favored of God. This is somebody that God intended to be the upright, righteous, sleek warrior for God. The darling of his heart. The one that he would call supremely happy and blessed. And yet I'll be honest, I don't look, I look over at Christendom and I see so many sad faces, so many hurting Christians, so many wounded people. Something's happened that God didn't intend to happen. It gets worse. You know what happens? How many of you realize that whenever, how many of you, when, whenever you used to work out, some of you men, you'd be honest about this, some of you men used to work out. I remember meeting, I met this guy, he was, a, he was an Olympic champion. And I didn't know that, and we were just talking. And, uh, and, and he's changed a lot. He stopped working out. Now, he was, he was an Olympic champion. I think he got a, a bronze medal. And, and so we were just talking about some things, and, and we were in his house, and, and he, he said to me, he said, we were talking about sports and something, and, and he said to me, he said, you know, I, I, have, I want a bronze medal in the Olympics. And I thought, <laughs> I wasn't born yesterday. What's the joke? He said, uh, he went on and he began to describe some stuff. And, and I'm thinking to myself, he don't look like a bronze medal winner to me. And then he pulled out a medal and some pictures. And you know something? He had a sculpted body. He had a, I could look at that picture and I could see he truly was an Olympic champion. But he didn't look like an Olympic champion. Some of you, when you got saved, God had intentions of making you an Olympic champion. I say this not just to you, but for my own self. I stand here like Kerry Robertson did and I wonder how much of my life have I wasted? Now, let me tell you why I say wasted. Well, you say, but revival, you know, revival didn't come that. I want to tell you something. 
God brought revival to show us what we should have been, what he wants us to be, what he wanted to do in the first place. That's why he brought revival. Because we'd accepted a standard that was way too short. Let me tell you, how many of you know that if you used to be, how many of you men used to be a great athlete? At least in your mind. Nobody's raising their hand. Now, I know in a crowd this size, there are some men in here that think that they used to be great athletes. When you stopped working out, when you stopped exercising, when you stopped being diligent, when you stopped enduring the hardship, did your body stay the same? It's not a trick question. It changed, didn't it? You see, when we don't press forward, in the Christian life, we change. Now, let me tell you how bad it can get. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You're grown fat, thick, and sleek. Then he forsook God who made him. That's the first thing. And scorned the rock of his salvation. The first thing that happens is that you begin to get fat spiritually. Now, you can never get enough prayer. You can never get too much of the Word. You can never get too much teaching. You can never get too much depth of the Word. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's the case. But you can get so much that you never exercise and you never use it and you never apply it that spiritually you're fat. There's no exercise. You just get more and more and more and more and more. I tell you, some of you probably have enough cassette tapes at home. You could build a 6,000-square-foot mansion. I mean, we've got Christians that have accumulated all kinds of tapes and all kinds of this and that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but what happens is how much of it do we apply? I, 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 don't, know, I don't know if it's true or not, but... Uh, it was said of, I believe it was D.L. Moody that he preached this message and he had a crusade and he's going to be there four or five nights and he preached this message and, and, uh, and it touched a lot of people. He preached the same message the next night. And it did touch some people and preached the same message the third night. And finally, the committee of pastors that were there with him, supporting him, they came to him and they said, you know, we just want to know, I mean, when are you going to change the message? He said, I'm going to change it as soon as you get it. I wonder how long we'd be on the same. Make it a lot easier on a lot of preachers. <laughs> Except we have to apply it too. <clears throat> Look how bad it gets. Verse 16, they made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. How about this one? They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they've not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. Friend, I want to tell you, Steve Hill has a statement. I think it's a great statement. I think it describes sin, and the way he describes it is sin is anything that Jesus would not do. Do you think we could also define it this way? I'm not talking about demon possession. But sacrificing to demons is living your life for anything Satan would do. Did you hear me? How about anger? How about jealousy? Would Satan do jealousy? Would Satan do anger? Are there demonic spirits that would do those things? Are there provokers of sin? I'm not talking about being demon-possessed right now. What he's saying is that this group of people that were designed by God to fulfill a course and to finish it, upright, darlings of his heart, destined to be supremely happy, happy and blessed, took so much of God in, began to take so much of him in, that all of a sudden something changed. They began to grow slick, sleek and fat and overgrown. They stopped exercising what they already knew they should be doing. 
They started looking for the next movement that came along. I'm not talking about you being here for revival right now. They begin to do all of these things. And the end result was their lives begin to represent demons more than they did Jesus Christ. I'll never forget this, but we... One time we started a, a church that I was pastoring. We started a discipleship program. And this, uh, this lady took on a brand new Christian girl and began to disciple her. As she began to disciple her, she took her through the discipleship course that we designed and she went through everything. And then when she got through the course, this, this, this new Christian came to her, to this mature Christian, and said, do you, do you know any good books on church history? And, and the lady didn't know any books on church history. And she said, no, I, I don't know any books on church. Maybe Pastor Bob could loan you some, but I don't know of any. But I have a question. Why do you want to study church history? She said, I, I just, I'm so excited about this book. I never realized that this is what Jesus was. I never realized that this is what he was all about. I didn't realize that the early church was like the book of Acts. I never heard that stuff before. I just want to study some church history. I want to know when the church and Christians stopped living like this. That was from a baby Christian. She recognized that it wasn't like that now. And at some point... They stop living like that. I, I want you to turn with me to another scripture, Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. I'm not going to go on a lot longer, but, but I just want you to see something. I tell you, I've never gotten over this scripture when I first begin to see it. My question is, are you on course to fulfill your destiny? Now listen to me. Are you going to finish the course? Are there things right now in your life that you need to bring to Jesus Christ tonight and say those things have got to know? I know this. An athlete would not win a race if he approached the Christian life the way I'm living it right now. He wouldn't finish. Isaiah 5. Friend, I, I don't know. This, this ought to strike every one of us. You know what happened when you got saved? Just park there for a minute because there's something else I'm going to share. What does what is, what is God intend for things to be like today? What, how far have we missed the course? How fat have we gotten? How sleek have we become? In other words, so full of ourselves. How much? How far have we missed it? Well, how about this? John the Baptist is in prison. He's heard the news. He's about to be beheaded. And so he sends word through some disciples to go to Jesus Christ and ask him this question. He's full of fear. He's full of doubt. He wants to know, if I die and I'm going to be giving myself to the right thing, are you the Messiah? Are you the one? Or should I look for another? He wants to know. He's ready to die, but he's got to know. And so they send word to Jesus. Jesus, in Matthew 11, sends word back to him. And guess what he says to him? Go tell John, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf are able to hear, and the dead are raised. I'll tell you something. He's bringing it back. I say he's bringing it back. I don't know about you. I, I've heard more about the dead being raised in the last five years, maybe six, seven years than I did all during the time that I was a Christian. I, I remember something that happened here. I guess it's all right to tell the story. It made the papers, but I remember walking in and being met by Steve Hill over here, just at the, at the base of those steps. <clears throat> Coming to revival just like any other night, I, I remember walking in here, and I remember Steve saying, Bob, go to the back. There's a dead baby back there. And then he walked on to the steps, up the steps, sat down right over here. And I'm standing there thinking, a dead baby. 
What does he mean? And then about that time, one of the ushers grabbed me by the arm and went up and we began to pray. The papers reported all of this. And what had happened was a father, mother, the baby was born dead. I don't know how they did it, but some way they called the church. And, 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 and I don't know who they talked to, but they talked to one of the officials here at the church, one of the leaders of the church, one of the pastors. And I, it, might have been, uh, it might have been John Kilpatrick. But at that particular time, uh, whoever talked with him urged him not to bring the baby. Don't, don't bring the baby. And you say, well, why in the world would you do that? Well, because we live in a crazy society. You just, you just can't pray for anything nowadays. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, there are laws and there are people. I mean, there are lawsuits and there's all kinds of stuff take, that take place. And so I'm sure there was some caution that was there. It wasn't somebody within the church. It was somebody who lived several counties away. Now, this person, as I understand the story, went to the trouble, though, to get through some government officials in the state of Florida, went through some trouble to get permission legally for that baby to be brought here. And so all of a sudden he shows up now. He's been told, don't bring the baby, but he shows up. He and his wife show up with the baby. Let me ask you a question. What are you going to do? No, 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 we don't do that kind of thing. And, and he got here just prior. To the, already there were some intercessors that were gathered in the back and had gathered around. And I, and I walked back there and some of those intercessors already had tears coming down their cheeks. So those intercessors' eyes were already bloodshot because they'd been crying. And I remember walking up. I've never raised the dead before. Oh, I want to see the dead raised. I've never done that before. And I walked up, and as soon as I got up there, I'm standing, I'm almost numb in my mind as to what's taking place. I don't quite believe it that it's really happening, but I know it's real. As I walk up there, they hand the baby to me, and here's this baby in my hands. And I feel this cold baby. I will never, ever, ever forget that. That baby was not raised from the dead. But I'll never forget what I felt. I sat back there and I cried, why? Why? You do this thing. God, you still do this stuff. You still raise the dead. God, I, I know there could be lots of reasons why. I don't know why. But God, why? And I felt the agony on the inside. I felt the limp. I hated being human right at that moment. And I began to just think, God, if I really were where you want me to be, I believe every other factor being met, whatever those are, that this baby can be raised from the dead. And so far as I knew, I was able to drive the doubt out of my mind. I really suddenly felt like this baby is going to be raised. And I stayed back there for a few hours, and the baby wasn't raised. I remember, I didn't hold the baby for two hours, but I remember for a good 30, 40 minutes holding that baby and then handing that baby to somebody else. I remember that. Janet, I think you were back there. I remember it. And I thought, God, you do this. What's the key? What, what words do, what are the right words? What's the right command? What's the right amount of boldness? What's the right amount of faith? What makes this happen? I don't have any more answers tonight than I had then. But my life has been changed because of that deceased baby. Because I want to see what Jesus told John the Baptist. I want to see it. I, I'm not going to be satisfied until I do see it. I may finish my course never having seen a dead baby raised. I may finish my course never having seen a dead person raised, but not without a protest. Say, that's dishonoring God. No, I don't believe so. But let me tell you where we might want to start. Look at what God says he did to his vineyard. 
Isaiah chapter 5, starting with verse 1. Let me sing now for my well-beloved. Now, I want you to imagine this. You are this vineyard. If you're born again, if you're a Christian, you are this vineyard. And here's what he said. A song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. You know what that means? That means that when the moment you were born again, the moment I was born again, if you're not born again in this place tonight, the moment you come forward and give your life to Jesus Christ, the moment you make a surrender, at that moment, you are as fertile as you will ever get. Now, I believe there's maturity. I believe there's growing in Christ. I believe those things are there. But I want to tell you, when you come to Christ and you ask him to forgive you of your sins, you are clean. You understand? You are clean. You don't get any cleaner. You are clean. When we were born into the kingdom of God, we were placed on a fertile hill. Jesus Christ. That hill, I believe, is the cross. And the power of the cross was able to do anything in our lives. Anything could be fulfilled. But we didn't believe it. We accepted a standard that was much less than what God had intended. We didn't believe in raising the dead. We didn't believe in doing the things. We didn't even believe in healing the sick. We didn't believe in doing all these things. We kind of hoped it would, and we found a doctrine that would explain of why those things weren't happening anymore. Now look at this. He dug it all around and removed its stones. I want to tell you something. When you became born again, he took every stone in your life out. Every stone out. He planted it with the choicest vine, and that vine is Jesus Christ himself. He gave you, he gave me everything that's needed to live. All the life we needed to draw from was right there in Christ. We didn't need anything else. He built a tower in the middle of it. He didn't just plant us in this place and attach us to the vine and then run off somewhere and say, I hope they do okay. He was right there every time we'd call on him. Are you hearing what I'm saying tonight? I say he was right there. You say, I don't know anything about prayer. You didn't have to know anything about prayer. All you had to do was call on him. You know, well, I, I don't know about the second coming. Well, you didn't have to know anything about the second coming. Well, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how exactly I want to go about studying the Bible. You didn't have to know how to study the Bible. You didn't have to have a course. You just had to open it up and say, God, make this real in my life. It's all you needed. I took the stones out. I put a tower up. Why? So I could watch over you as you pursued me. He hewed out a wine vat in it and expected it to produce good grapes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But it produced only worthless ones. Now, in this chapter, and I'm coming to a close, but in this chapter... He talks about the things that make it worthless. Very quickly, if you just look at some of the things that he talks about. Verse 8 and 9. What are those who had house to house and joined field to field and there's no rural room so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land? Now, I'm not talking about something wrong with you building a house, but that speaks to me of possessiveness. I made everything where they could grow to be my beloved, upright, darling one, extremely happy and blessed. I did all the things of removing the stones. Everything was there. But they got so religious on me. They grew fat and they began to kick against me. Then they forgot me. Then they forsook me. They regarded me lightly. And then they started acting more like demons than my people. The second thing, possessiveness. The, first, the second thing, verse 11 and 12. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may pursue strong drink, who stay up late in the evening that wine may inflame them, and their banquets are accompanied by a lyre and harp and tambourine and flute and by wine, but they do not pay attention to the deeds of the Lord, nor do they consider the work of his hands. I call that self-indulgence. They just begin to indulge themselves and indulge themselves and indulge themselves and indulge themselves and get so fat and unable to move spiritually and to go on with me. And, and they made a party of it. I, I, know it's, I know it's got a measure of truth to it, so I, I don't mean to be totally critical. I've been in churches with this name where there are, there are live wire churches, but... I tell you, whenever I see it driving down the road and I see a poster, big old poster, 
and, and, and it says, come celebrate Jesus. I know there's a great deal of truth there. I know that we're to do that, but I know there's just something about that word celebrate that just seems to miss the mark with me. I'm all for worship, but I just wonder if we've ever learned how to fall on our faces before him. Before we sing the songs, before we praise, and before we celebrate so much. I wonder if we've ever come to the place where it's so easy. I never will forget being in a church and the pastor took hold of his Bible. And I was going to be getting up to speak and he took hold of his Bible and said, Okay, they do this every Sunday morning. How many brought your Bibles? And everybody raised their Bibles just like this. He said, Wave your Bibles! Wave your Bibles! And they begin to shout, wave your Bible. And all of a sudden, the place just broke out. I'm telling you, it was exuberant. It was absolutely on fire, apparently. And they just started shouting and jumping and praising. And the pastor kept saying, there's no demons around here, Satan. You have no place being here. You said, what's wrong with that? Nothing. If you're standing on a fertile hill. But later on, I found out that pastor was into all kinds of kinky sex. And his wife was having to go through this stuff with him, and she was in absolute bondage, and the power of God broke her. Later on, later on, in one of the messages we we're preaching, and, and, the, and the pastor got up after the message, and he said, I just want you to know that this man I really appreciate, and he's a good man, and I like what he's saying, but it's wrong. <laughs> he said, it's an error. You can't live like what he's saying. And then he finished, after about 10 minutes of that, he finished and he turned to me and says, Now, I want you to have your freedom. Go ahead with the invitation. I wouldn't want to go ahead with an invitation. But God gave me something and I got up and I said it and the first one to run to the altar was his son. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not enough to shout and wave the Bible and scream. Uh, look, look what it said, the, the, the possessiveness, the self-indulgence. Look at verse 19. Look, look carefully at these. We say, who say, let him make speed, let him hasten his work that we may see it. Let the purpose of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come to pass that we may know it, crying out, Jesus, come back. Yes, amen to that sermon on the second coming. Let him come. Verse 21, what are those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight, able to pick out the sin in everybody else's life, but be so full of pride, so full of arrogance? Verse 24, or excuse me, verse uh, 23, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the ones who are in the right. I don't have time to go all of that, but how does that compare to that vineyard that he saw that he built on a fertile hill? Possessiveness, it's self-indulgence, moral deception, pride, disobedience, it'll all come in. And that's the same out of the same vineyard. Fortunately, God begins to end talking about Jeshurun in a way that he begins to talk about what he's going to do in his life. And he ends up in Isaiah 42 as a strong, powerful message of victory. And I won't even try to go into that tonight, but I want to close with this. And I, I want you to examine yourself. Listen, to really be free, maybe first of all, we need to realize that it's not God's fault that we're in the condition we're in. God didn't make us this way. He didn't produce us this way. We didn't miss out on some special teaching. When we were born again, we were that fertile vineyard expected to produce good grapes. We produce worthless ones. I wonder if you've allowed something like self-indulgence and all of these other things, possessiveness, just forgetting the Lord. If you want revival, let it start there. If I want revival, I must start there. What have I done to defile the vineyard? And I want to tell you something. I'm saying this because you may be here tonight having never given your heart to the Lord or having given your life to Jesus and nothing changed, nothing happened. I know that. That's exactly what I did. When I was a sophomore in high school, I, I came forward with a great amount of tears. There was a revival. There was an evangelist that was preaching, and I came forward, and I gave my life to the Lord, and one of my best buddies came with me, and neither one of us went on to live with God. But everybody told us we were saved. 
there are a lot of people that think they're saved. And there's never, ever, ever been a change in their life. And they say, well, I just didn't have the right this and the right that. I don't know what your condition is, but tonight we're going to pray for those. I want to give you an opportunity to come right here to this altar and begin to say, I want to, yes, there are some things that were in the vineyard that I still have in my life today that I have to get rooted out. I have to clear the way so that God can come and begin to move upon me and produce in me what he wants to produce. And some decisions have to be made. I don't want you to make a mistake of coming to the revival this week or having been here for several months or a year and then say, I've got this thing in my life and I know it's got to go, but I'm just waiting for God to put a hand on it. If you know it's there, it's got to come out. You're really not growing. You may feel like you are. You've got all the appearance. But I want to tell you something. The vineyard is not producing good grapes. I want you to stand with me. And right now is a decision that only you can make personally. Nobody else can make it for you. Because, see, the choice is, if you've got something in your life, I want to tell you, God removed the stones. When you were born again, he removed the stones. Now, I, I say probably most of us have gone this way, but if there's something that's gripped you and grabbed you, and, you know, I feel this strongly. I feel like that there are some habitual sins here tonight, some habitual sins some things that you're practicing over and over and over. I don't know. Maybe it's just self-indulgence. Maybe it's just pampering yourself. Maybe you're, maybe you're like Reuben. Maybe you've been blessed. Maybe you even live in a great place with a great church. I don't know. But something's happened. You should be producing fruit. You're not producing any fruit. It's not there. You know, one of the easiest things to do is to leave where you are and come back to the revival because nobody really knows you here and then go back with just a little bit of change over a few areas, but never really experiencing the power of God loosed in your life, never really cutting loose, never experiencing His fullness. Why? Because you left some stones in the vineyard. And God says, I want to remove them. I, I just feel this so strongly. I'm not trying to make it a pressure for you. I, I'm telling you the Holy Spirit. I feel it so strongly. There's, there are some habitual habits in this place tonight that have to be broken. They're habitual habits. I'm not going to even try to name them. Some of them may be what you would consider minor. So, but I'm saying there are things that you already, you don't need somebody to preach to you and say this is sin. They are habitual habits. They are habitual things. They range everywhere from lust temper, or whatever it would be, but they're habitual. They're still holding on to you. And I'm telling you that there's a tower built, and God is watching, and he's saying, I want to make you fertile. I want to make you my gesture on. I want you to be upright, my darling, supremely happy and blessed. But these stones have to get out first. I'm asking you to do this. I'm asking you, those of you that have been at the revival for a long period of time, and some of these habitual things have stayed dominating your life, I'm asking you tonight to say they're going to die right here. And those of you, those of you who are here for the first time, and you came, this is the place that you need to start. You need to start with those things that are habitually, habitually, overriding you. You're not the overcomer. They're overcoming you. They're overriding you. They're dominating you. You know what happened? First of all, when the children of Israel went into the land of promise, the first thing that happened is that they began to disregard how important it was to drive the inhabitants out. And the first thing that started happening is that they sort of lived alongside them. The next step that took place was this. They not only did that, they began to in integrate with them. The next thing that happened was they began to intermarry with them. The final thing that happened is they became just like them. Because I tell you something, you leave sin there, it will destroy you. You leave sin there. You let it become a habit. You let it become something there. I want to tell you something. It's, 
It's just tightening its noose round and round and round and round and round and round about you. And the tragedy is not so much, now I, I don't want to be misunderstood, but the tragedy, believe it or not, is not so much the sin. The tragedy is that God says, I'll clean the vineyard and you won't come. I'll clean it out and you won't let me have it. I'll deal with it, but you won't be free because you keep something hidden back there. I want you to do this. If you've got something that the Holy Spirit has pinpointed tonight, don't carry it out of this place. Come right now to this altar. Right now. Right now. Come on. Right now. Especially those habitual habits. Be honest. Be honest with God right now because you're making a decision. And the decision, see, He knows what's there. He knows what's there. So you make the decision tonight that this habitual thing will be broken in my life tonight. Come on. Come on. Right now. Right now. You're coming to break the bondage of a habitual habit. And you're saying, I want it gone tonight. I want to tell you something. God can break it right now. You don't have to walk out of here with it. You can absolutely have it broken over you. Every dominating sin that's there, God says, let's, let me tell you something. He's always taking you. He's always taking you to his place of intimacy. He's ready to clean you up. He's ready to wash you by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Jesus said, go tell John the blind have their eyes open. I want you to understand this. Are you blind? Are you following something that's not producing any fruit in your life? Are you following a blind person into a ditch? The blind cannot see. You can't see. You know what a blind person misses? First of all, they get filled with bitterness, and they get filled with disobedience. And they, but let me tell you, the greatest loss is they lose sight of the beauty of Jesus and what he wants to do. How, how about this? Not just the blind, but how about the lame? How about the lame? Does God need to perform a miracle in your life tonight where you're not, you, you know what the lame are? The lame cannot walk straight. They cannot walk the way they're designed to walk. And you know tonight, if there's something in your life right now, I don't know what it is, but whatever has gotten hold of you, and you're not walking straight. And you know you're not walking straight. You're lame spiritually. You're drifting along. You might have one good leg, but the other leg just keeps dragging you along, and you're not changing. He said, the deaf hear. The deaf. The deaf. If you can't hear the voice of God, and God intends you to, why do you think that is? Could it be because there's not the pursuit of God to hear his voice? Could it be because there's not the openness with God that he can speak to you? When's the last time you heard God speak to you? Why? Could it be because you're not pursuing him enough to let him in? And the lepers, lepers speak of that unclean thing that you know is there. A leper, he doesn't have to get up in the morning and wonder if there's something unclean there. He knows it's there. And you, is there something in your life that you're going to get up with tomorrow morning? Something about your life tomorrow morning. You're going to get up. You're making a decision now and you're declaring something. And tomorrow morning when you get up, in fact, Holy Spirit, I'm just asking you, if they don't surrender tonight, that when they wake up the first thing in the morning, that that unclean thing will be brought right before their eyes. God, pursue them. Hound them with it. Until they're willing to. Don't let it destroy them, Lord Jesus. Come on and get rid of it. Come on and get rid of it. You woke up this morning knowing it was unclean. You knew it was unclean last week. You know it's unclean tomorrow. Send it to the cross and let it die. Let it die. Then I want to ask this question again. The dead are raised. You know what that means spiritually? That means that no matter how much you go to church, no matter what you're doing, that there's no life in you whatsoever. It's just not there. I say it's just not there. You don't have any life in you. There's no pursuit of God. You know, I really believe that there's some people here who seldom, seldom, seldom ever open this book and read it. Seldom open it. Seldom open it. You just don't do it. You just don't do it. Now, I'm not condemning you, but I'm saying something to you. There's, you're dead. You're dead. Some of you who know that you ought to pray, you can hear the hardest sermon preached about prayer, but you're not praying. You're really not praying. There's so much occupying your life. I tell you, much of Christ, I never will forget Leonard Ravenhill used to make this statement. He, he said this a number of times, but he said to me one time, he said, Bob, if you ever go to a pastor's conference 
and you want to get a big altar call. He wasn't saying this because it was the right thing to do or that he did that. He said, if you want to go to a meeting and you get a writer, preach a scathing message on prayerlessness and invite the pastors. He said, it'll fill up the place. Now, if that's happening in the pulpit, what's happening in the pew? Are you dead? You'll never be raised to new life if you don't come to the place where you say, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. Is anybody here right now? Be honest. Praise God. Praise God for your boldness. Praise God for stepping out. Now present this to God. Present it to God. I, I tell you, there's somebody, I, I'm not trying to prolong, but I feel the tug so strongly. There's somebody else. It's not blindness. It's not a loss of hearing. It's not deafness. It's not lameness. It's deadness. It's deadness. It's deadness. It's a deadness in your soul. You want it to change. You want it to change. But it's deadness. Come on. Come on. Come on. Praise God. Come on. Come on. Jesus is going to bring life to you tonight. You're going to get up and you're going to walk out of this place changed. He's got more for you than you'll even get tonight, but you're going to change. Praise God. Praise God. Anyone else right now? Right now, we're going to close. The, we're going to close. You're going to, but you need to come. Be honest with God. You've got to start right here. Come on. It's hard sometimes. Part of the reason it's hard is because we like to think we're not really dead, but there's nothing there that we can call life. I want to say this to you. What do you think about the love of Jesus? Do you understand how much he loves you? If when you were first born again, when you first came to him, what he did with your vineyard was take all the stones out, put a tower up so he could watch over you. If what he did was to do everything possible so you could produce fruit, do you think he loves you less now? No. His love is perfect and it doesn't stop. What's he wanting to do for you tonight? What's he wanting to do in your life right now? I tell you, begin right now where you are. Come on, if someone else needs to come. But those at the altar, begin, <clears throat> first of all, to pinpoint what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about. What is it? What is it? What is it? Agree with him. Tell him. Tell him what it is. Say, God, I want to change tonight. I want to change tonight. I don't want to leave here. He'll hear your cry. I don't want to leave here. Tell him, I'm not leaving here. I'm not leaving here like I was. Lord, I have to be changed. I'm not leaving here with what I brought in. I have to be changed. And right now, you begin to talk to him. Just begin to cry out to him. Just begin to cry out to him and tell him. Just tell him. Just tell him. Just tell him. You're his darling. You know that? You're his darling. I don't know some of you men, maybe that's too weak a term. But I like it. I, I like it. I like what it conveys. My wife doesn't use that term with me. She'll use another term. But I like it. I like to hear that voice of intimate intimacy that's not just some word. And Jesus right now, right now is just wooing you. He's wooing you. I'm telling you, he's changing you tonight. He's changing you tonight. He's washing you. You're going to get up from this place clean, but you've got to mean business with God. You can't just come and make some confession. It's not in works and crying out, but you've got to say, God, I'm at this place. It's going to change tonight. I accept nothing less than a cleansing. Jesus. Jesus. Let's just pray. Let's just pray. 
Jesus. I tell you, it can be loud, it can be weeping, it, it doesn't have to be crying, it doesn't, but I'll tell you something, make sure that you don't listen to my voice right now, that you begin to tell God you want to leave changed. You begin to tell Him that you want things to change tonight. And I'm telling you, He loves you so much. He takes a Jabez and a Paphroditus. He doesn't care what's happening in your past. He's out to change you. He can change you tonight. You don't have to leave here. You do not have to leave here with anything that's been holding you in bondage. I don't care what the devil tells you. I don't care how many times you fail. I want to tell you something. He knows how to take care of his vineyard. You're his vineyard if you give your life to him tonight. Jesus. Jesus. Mighty God. Let's just wait on him just a moment. Let's wait on him just a moment. Now let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's that's all right. And he's, he, what he's saying is absolutely true. What he's saying is true. But, but right now, just, let's, let's just, let's just let the Holy Spirit deal with us individually right now. Right now. I tell you, he's doing a deep work in some people. Jesus, do it, Lord. Do it, Holy Spirit. Holy God. Oh, God, come with your presence tonight. Wash and cleanse, Jesus. I come against in the name of Jesus. Every habitual sin. Every habitual sin. From fear and distrust to lust. Your power is broken tonight in Jesus' name. Every spirit of bondage that's become habitual tonight, break it, Jesus. Break it, Jesus. Break it over their lives. Release tonight in Jesus' name. Set them free, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Holy God. Don't you wait on anybody else. You tell him what it is, you ask him to break it, and you say this, I don't want it anymore. Ask him to make you sick of it. You, you need to get just as sick over this as I got over that tobacco. I mean, you need to get to the place where you want to spit it out. It burns on the inside. It tastes horrible. That's the way you need to be about the sin tonight that's held you in bondage. God, give me a taste for it that's sickening to my soul, that's sickening to my spirit. Break it over me tonight. Break it over me, Jesus. Holy God. Holy God. Blessed Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Any of you men have a word from the Lord, just, just come and say, Jesus. 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 Some have already broken through, and I can feel that, but there's, there's some that are here. You say, well, what do I do to break through? Just, just surrender to him. Just surrender to him. Just surrender to him. Just tell him. Plant your feet spiritually tonight and say, I'm not going to walk in this anymore. Here's, here's what I'd like to do. Those of you who responded to the idea of the deadness that's there, to be honest, I'd, I'd like for you to raise your head. Don't get up. Don't anybody get up. But you responded. You say, yes, that spoke to me. The de There's a deadness in my life. And I'd like for some of the prayer team to come out right now. Do we have some prayer team people? Do we have some prayer team people? If we could just come and pray with these. That, just keep it up until somebody just comes up. Don't pray a long time because this is Jesus' work. You understand he's going to change you. It's going to change you. But if you are, if you're here, uh, some of the school of ministry students, if you see somebody's hand raised right now, just slip out right now. Just walk up to them. Just begin to pray. And, and just take authority. All I want you to do is take authority over the deadness and say, God, bring life. Bring life. Keep your hand up until somebody gets there to you. Keep your hand up until somebody prays with you. Then I don't have to pray a long time. Just as your hand is up. Bring new life. Those, the rest of you that say, well, it was blindness or it was, it was deafness. It was something else in my life. That's all right. You just press into the Lord. He's going to touch you where you are. He's going to change you tonight. He's going to change you tonight. He's going to change you tonight.
If you're a pastor here and your life is clean with the Lord and you see a hand that's up, just come, come and, and, and join us and help us. Now, pastor, if, you're, if your life is clean before God, come, if there's a hand up, come and pray for them. Just, just pray for life to come back in. Jesus, touch them, Lord. Touch us in this place, Jesus. Bring the vineyard alive again, Lord. Touch us in this place, Lord Jesus. Holy God. Holy God. Holy God. Anyone else? There's been some deadness. No one's prayed for you yet. Raise your hand again. Raise it high. There's some, there's some people right over here. If we could get... Megan, could you pray with this girl right here? Right here in the blue. And Megan, there's one right over here in the blue, too. Right, right, there, right there. I tell you, something else you need to do, as the Lord begins to release you, and you, you feel the release because of His love, just begin to thank Him. Just begin to thank Him for setting you free. You understand that you could have lived in years and years and years and years of bondage and that tonight, with one touch, suddenly He comes and He breaks the power of that thing over your life. Jesus. Ooh, holy God. Holy God. Holy God. Jesus, touch them, Lord. Jesus. There's a girl right here in the blue. Sherry's praying with There's another one over here somewhere else. Raise your hand if you, no one's prayed with you. Raise your hand. Raise it high. No one's prayed with you, and you want prayer right now. Okay. Janet, Janet, yeah, right here, okay, Jesus, yeah, right here, praise God, pray, begin to thank him as you feel his release, just begin to thank him, Jesus, 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 hallelujah, hallelujah, we're not going to try to fill out any decision cards or anything tonight because we, we don't we don't have a lot of people uh, here right now that are on the prayer team that, but i tell you what we do i'd like for us to pray for everybody here tonight as you begin to stand as you feel the release just begin to stand if you want prayer tonight the prayer team come and we're going to begin to pray for all of these we're going to begin to just we're just going to pray lay hands on you i want to i want to say something to you those of you that maybe you're only going to be here tonight. There may be some, maybe only tonight is the night that, that you're here. Would, would, you, would you come right down here and, and just, just get right here if, if, so we can pray for you first? And, uh, but let me tell you something. All this week, tomorrow night will be an exception because you'll be a part of prayer. You'll be a part of crying out to God. But all of this week, Friday night, Saturday night, don't just get prayed for once, just get prayer. Get prayer. God's got something He wants to impart to you. We're going to worship the Lord while we do that and while we begin to pray for you. But if you want prayer tonight, you want prayer. If, even if you didn't come forward, if you want prayer, then you need to stand. Those of you, if God's still dealing with you, you stay right where you are. Stay right where you are. But if you want prayer, it might be for healing. If someone comes up to you to pray, uh, you don't have to give them a whole history. But just simply say, I need a healing in my body. We believe Jesus heals. And he has been healing in this place. If, if God's still dealing with you, you stay right there on the floor. Don't dare move. Let him go deep inside. Let him bring that free repentance. The grace that's free through repentance. Just stay right where you are. But if you want prayer, as, as God releases you, then stand. We're going to worship the Lord. Let's, let's just begin to pray for him.